Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. All right. Tonight is the parent's role in a home. Um, We've got about two weeks left of this series and we'll be done uh, toward the end of the month of October uh, with it and uh, all of it's on YouTube if you want to see it it's on our website if you want to go back and review it any uh, some people I notice go back and they they do view it on YouTube I don't know how many uh, watch it on the website but they it is available that way if you miss something or uh, if you skip a night or whatever it is, so you can go back and, and pick that up. I've been studying this. I've been kind of in this mode studying this lesson series. You know, when, when, I, when I start doing something, I kind of get in that mode. If I'm working on Bible school, I'm in Bible school mode, you know, and, and nothing else really is visible to me. And, and so when I'm teaching on a series like this, I'm pretty well in that mode every day of the week, even though I'm not studying it. Uh, I, it is still somewhere in my mind, so that whatever I encounter, whatever I think about, still I come back to the lesson plans. And I made an obser- observation this a couple of days ago, um, and I shared it with my wife. She didn't think it was all that funny, but as I observe our society and the married people in it, I, I've noticed that there are many good wives married to lousy husbands and there are many good husbands who are married to lousy wives but I get to wondering what if all of the good husbands would have married the good wives and all of the good wives would have married the good husbands and all of the lousy husbands would have married the lousy wives and all of the lousy wives would have married the lousy husbands I think if that would have happened then all marriages would be wedded bliss and the rest of the world would be dead. <laughs> Take your Bible tonight turn to Ephesians chapter 6. The book of Ephesians gives us information about what people want and what they need. Uh, when you read the book of Ephesians, sometimes we read it inside out. You know, uh, husbands love your wives, wives obey your, uh, you know, Surrender to your husbands and children obey your parents. And we we read it inside out. But what God is really telling us in the book of Ephesians is if people could let you know what is down on the inside of their heart that they really, really need, this is what it would be. If your husband wants to know what his wife really needs, she really needs to be loved by her husband. And and so on. And so when we get to this on, on children tonight... It's not just instructions to the parent on how to do it, but it's also a a word from God on what your children need from you. Okay? Ephesians 6 verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. There are no experts. Before we get too far into this study tonight, I want you to understand something. There are no experts when it comes to raising children. Now let me explain. There are some people who think that they are experts. They've gone to classes. They ta- have an education. They hold a degree. They have had professional training. But none of that makes someone an expert at raising your children. You follow me? There are some people, so-called experts who have never had any children of their own. There are some who are still rearing their own children, and there are some who have reared children, but they did it 20 or 30 years ago in a different age and a different time. But the fact is, no matter who you listen to or who you take your advice from, they have not raised your children. They may understand their own children, 
And they may have gathered some information from other people and after much trial and error have figured out some of the things that you need to know as a parent, but they have not raised your children. They've not raised your kids who have your DNA, who have your strengths and your weaknesses, your tendencies and your personality quirks. They don't live in your home. They're not mar married to your spouse. They don't have to deal with all of the variables that you deal with. Your in-laws and the outlaws and the friends and the neighbors and sickness and disease and finances and job security and a 10,000 other things, all of which affect your efforts when rearing your child in your home. There are no experts, per se. But what I'm telling you tonight is, you can go ahead and read Dr. So-and-so's book. Or you can watch uh, What's-Her-Name's video or what you might call it seminar, but just keep in mind that expert has not raised your children. So tonight, I'm not going to give to you my expert advice. I may on occasion give you my opinion, but I'll spell it out as just that, my opinion. But keep in mind, I am not the answer man when it comes to rearing your children. Here's a thought that will scare you. <laughs> your child is made up of half of you and half of your spouse. You know you. You know what you were like when you were 8. You know what you were like when you were 15 or 16. And God has a sense of humor. He will let you have a child that may do some of the things that you did. You don't even have to tell them about it. You don't have, and nobody has to fill them in. This is what your mom did or what your dad did when they were your age. They just seem to automatically pick it up. As parents, Lisa and I will be the first to admit that we've made many mistakes and we're probably still making a few. I have the microphone <laughs> and the camera. We're not experts. We don't have all of the answers, but we do know a place where all of us can go to find the answers in the direction we need to raise our kids. And that's in the Word of God. Now, I want to talk a little bit about determinism. If you somehow think that by learning a few things and then applying those things, that formula, to your family that your children will grow up being perfect angels you are so sadly mistaken I, I, I think I get tickled when I see some of the young families around here who are just beginning to raise their children and they're having their little meetings off in the corner and they're talking about how they're doing it well, I just read this book. You should read this book. It's a great book. You should read it. It's a bestseller. It's, yeah, I'll, I'll give it you my copy when I get done with it. <laughs> and they'll tell how they're going to do it. And that's, that's okay in itself. But it's when they turn around to some older folks like the rest of us and they go, you know, I'll tell you how you do this. <laughs> your kids ain't raised yet. Don't be telling nobody nothing because your kids ain't raised yet. <laughs> there are people who pat themselves on the back because their kids turned out well who had absolutely nothing to do with it. There are other people that raise their kids as good as you could raise a child, and that child just turns sour on them. And the people that's got the good kid want to go, well, you know, we did a better job. No, you got lucky. You got lucky. If you somehow think by learning a little bit and then applying the formula that, that your kids will turn out great, you're just, you're just sadly mistaken. Some people have taken Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. I've heard that verse a million times in my lifetime. And they've used that verse to convince themselves that if they do parenting the right way, that their child will live on the straight and narrow and someday become an adult that they can be proud of. That idea is called determinism. Determinism is a philosophy stating that for everything that happens, there are conditions that such such that, given those conditions, nothing else could happen. In, in other words, if you do it this way, 1, 2, 3, A, B, C, it'll always turn out perfectly like this. That's determinism. The problem is, determinism is not scriptural. Determinism is not from the Word of God. Let me give you a great example. Adam and Eve had the perfect father, God the Father. And they lived in a perfect environment. 
And yet Adam and Eve still rebelled against their perfect parent and fell into sin. Was that God's fault? Was it society's fault? Mom and Dad, you can do everything right. You can do it all by the book, but personal sin is still a personal choice. You can do your job as a godly parent and handle your responsibility well, but what your child does with it is still up to them. It's called free will. <laughs> free will. Free will. Granted, the odds are much better when you do things God's way. But you haven't seen, but you've seen it and I've seen it, is the good child coming out of the bad home life and then the bad child coming out of the good one. Doesn't seem to make any sense. But determinism is not scriptural. So if you think that you're just going to do it one, two, three, A, B, C, and your child will be perfect, you may lie to yourself and fool yourself, but all of the people that know your child outside of your home is going to go, well, they're just being stupid <laughs> because their child is not perfect. If you don't care about your family, then you don't care about your future. The one thing you need to care about first and foremost is your family. After all, it's your children who will choose which nursing home you will go to someday. <laughs> I saw an ad for one the other day. It said, Beauty Acres Nursing Home. We care so you don't have to. <laughs> The family is of utmost importance. It's of utmost importance because everything else in society is predicated on the family. As the family goes, so goes our world. As the family goes, so goes our society. As the family goes, so goes our community. As our family goes, so goes the schoolhouse, and so goes the church house. Everything else in society is hedged upon the success of the family. So we can't sidetrack it. We can't ignore it. We can't bury our heads in the sand and not deal with it because if we're ever going to survive, we have to deal with the issues and address the trials and study the makeup and the structure of the family as it's supposed to be. Politics aren't important. Now, I know you think it's an election year and whoever gets elected is going to impact your home and your family. But it's not what's happening at the White House. It's what's happening at your house that really matters. Legislation isn't important. We have more laws on the books now than ever before, but we're still bombarded with all kinds of troubles. Education is irrelevant. We've had a no-holds-bar attempt to educate society. and We've spent billions of dollars on education reform, yet we not only have the same problems we've had, but we now have new problems that are coming up every day. The economy isn't important. The economy has come and gone many times over the years, but there has still been good families and there have been bad families, whether we're in a recession or a depression or in a golden age. It's all irrelevant if we do nothing about the family first. Okay? Now, you're going to need your Bible for this. We've talked about the role of the man in the home, and we've discussed the role of the wife in the home. But one of the greatest challenges in life isn't being a husband or a wife, as difficult as that may seem. But one of the greatest challenges you will ever face is being a parent. How many of you remember when your first child was born? How did you feel? How did it make you feel? Scared. Scared. Mandy, our oldest daughter, was born. She's... 50? I don't know what she... Uh, <laughs> she'd been married 32 years. She would be third, going on 31, yeah. Um, we, Lisa had her at the old Paulding Hospital. Now, if you're familiar with the old Paulding Hospital, uh, nowadays they would probably use that for scenes for horror movies and things <laughs> like that, you know. It was back... You know, I, I see these people going to the hospital today to have a kid, and they take them into this luxury room, with a TV set, a refrigerator, a DVD player, satellite TV, you know what, all of this stuff, sandwiches down the hallway, there's a coffee thing there. You know what I had? A waiting room. A waiting room with a plastic couch with metal arms on it, and it was only that long. So you couldn't stretch out. We had a black and white TV up in the corner that got two channels. And that was it. That was the entertainment. We were there by ourselves. Lisa was 
was in, in labor at night, and so none of the family was there, none of the friends was there. It was just the two of us. And she gave birth to Mandy. And, of course, Mandy was a little, little, like a little bird. She was just a little teeny tiny thing. She was 4 pounds and 11 ounces, 13 ounces, 12 ounces, somewhere around in there. But I know I could hold her in the palm of my hand like this. We actually went to, you remember Rinks, Bargain City, and Defiance? And they had their, their toy department in the little port out the front of the building there. We went in there after she was born, and we purposely bought a doll sweater and put it on her and took her picture to just show she was little enough to wear a doll sweater. She had a little tiny thing, and, and uh, Lisa had finally gone to sleep, and I was looking at Mandy laying there, and, and I thought, I'm her dad. And a sense of pride just welled up in me. I'm her dad. And then I got to thinking, I'm her dad. And a sense of fear welled up inside of me. I thought, I'm not qualified for this job. I mean, my dad ought to be raising her. I don't have the tools for this. And this poor child's going to have to grow up with me as her father. And then I prayed for her because I was sure that I wasn't up for the challenge. I had no idea of what to do. You know, we have teenagers now that are having children that are barely, they're not even prepared for adulthood, let alone parenthood. They have no idea what they're doing. I was an adult, graduated from college, had my degree, had been married for a little over a year, and, and, and I still wasn't ready for the job. Every day when your children leave your home, there are systems at work that will try to undo everything that you have tried to do with them at home. The competition today is a peak level. Your children's peers are going to give them a different story than what you gave them. Their school teacher is going to give them a different story than what you've taught them. The television set is going to give them a different story than what you want them to know. Movies and video games are going to give them a different story. Professional sports stars and musicians are going to give them a different story. So parent, you're going to have to do your job and do your job well if your family is going to survive. Scary, isn't it? Scary, isn't it? Jimmy, when he was younger, came home from school one day, and, and uh, they were studying, uh, not the creation, just the beginning of the earth and all of that. And Jimmy just casually said to him, well, yeah, Dad, well, billions of years ago, you know, this here, and he went into some sort of an evolution-type theory that he had heard that day in school. And, a, man, a light went on my head. I thought, wait a minute. You're a preacher's kid. You've been in church your whole life. Don't you know any better than that? No, he was going to the school that we sent him to, listening to adult teachers that we had taught him to respect who was telling him supposedly what the facts were. And I made up my mind back then, and this has been 20-some years ago, that in this church we are going to teach Scripture. We are going to teach and teach and teach. We are going to teach creationism. Uh, we're going to teach uh, creation science. We're going to teach things that are counteractive to the things that are wrong and that are lies, that are ungodly, that will be taught to them elsewhere. Scary. It's scary. Now, if you're going to do it right, I'd suggest to you tonight that you're going to need your Bible. While society has changed and education has changed and morals have changed and our government has changed, children have not changed. They tell you all they want to tell you, but kids fundamentally are still the same. The Bible hasn't changed and God hasn't changed. So you're going to need your Bible to pull this off. You'll need to deal with what is constant and not what is inconsistent. You're going to need advice and direction that never changes and never fails. What you don't need is opinions and fads and the latest political correctness. What you don't need is what Oprah says and what Dr. Phil says and what they're telling you on The View. You need your Bible for this one. There are four things that you need to know to be a good parent. There are actually a million, but we've narrowed them down to four for tonight, for the sake of time. Verse 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of God. He begins by saying, and fathers. 
There's a cultural and a biblical reason for the Apostle Paul's statement. Biblically, the father is always viewed as a representative head of the home. He's the one through whom and to whom God would speak, and then God would hold him accountable to transfer that information to his wife and to his children. God would speak to the head of the house. The head of the house then would teach his family what God had told him. Okay? He's the one through who God spoke. That's why when Satan wants to do away with dad. That's why the devil wants fatherless homes. That's why he wants two lesbians to think they're qualified to raise a child. That's why he wants dad to always be at work and then out with the boys and absent from the home. Dad, you need to think about this when you consider walking out on your children. Because the devil knows that if he can get you to walk out on your children, that you have also walked out on your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren because the Bible says in Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin in rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So if you're doing it wrong now, you're doing it wrong for a lot of people to come. Ladies, I hope that you'll understand this too. This is why in our church we emphasize men. Not because we're anti-women, not because we are chauvinistic, but because we realize that men are what is lacking in culture. Men are what is lacking in our society and in the church. We aren't getting enough men in places of leadership and there aren't enough men taking responsibility There aren't enough men taking the responsibility that God has given to them in the home and in the church and in the community. God has given women great grips and great abilities, and we can't function in our society or in our homes or in our churches without the the women. They have kept this boat afloat many years. But the great challenge today is to win men and to get them back in the rightful place of responsibility in God's divine order of creation. That's why we are hard on the men. That's why we preach to the men and why we teach to the men. We're not just doing that so that, uh, you know, you can bring him here and get him slapped around a little bit. If the men get it right, if the men get it right, then a lot of other things are going to fall into place. There is also a cultural reason for this statement. In Rome, women didn't have many rights. There was no women's liberation movement. They had little or no say in any matter at all. But in Rome, when a baby was born, That baby was brought in before its father, and the father decided thumbs up or thumbs down. The father decided whether to keep the child and let that child live, or to subject that that infant to the elements and let it die. Life and death was in the father's hands. When a Roman father wanted his firstborn to be a boy, and that firstborn child was a girl, he could, by the authority of the Roman law, turn his thumb down and call for the extinguishing of that child's life. Or that child to be sold, or given away as an orphan, or raised in a brothel to be a future prostitute. But Jesus said, fathers, you cannot abandon your responsibility. You are God's representative to your home. Fathers, you have the power of life or death in your hand. What happens to your child is your choice, but I'm going to hold you accountable for your decision. That power of life and death is still in dad's hands. It's still in dad's hands. And a lot of children are going to an early grave because dad is not doing his job. God spoke to the father's representative for the family, but these four items are for the fathers and for the mothers alike. Number one, four things you must know to be a good parent. You must encourage your children. He says, do not provoke your children to anger. Colossians 3.21, in the King James it says, don't provoke your children to anger. The NIV states it as, don't exasperate your children. In other words, don't discourage your children, but rather encourage your children. One thing that a child needs to know is that even though in society they're a nobody, when they come home, they are a somebody. They may not be as intelligent as the other kids in their class. They may not be as athletic as the neighbor boy. They might not be as good looking as the neighbor girl. They might not be as popular as the kids down the road. But when they're at home in your house, they are somebody. How do you provoke or discourage a child? Well, you discourage a child when you show favoritism. You discourage your child when you value one child more than another because they're more like you. And you can relate to them better. So you spend more time with them and you do more things with them because they like what you like. 
They think like you think. A good example of this is Jacob and his son Joseph. You can't play favorites because all of your children are equally your children. When you begin playing favorites with your children and one parent sets against another children, uh, another parent, one is on the side of this child, one is on the side of this child, you provoke your children. You discourage your child and, uh, when you try to push them into your dreams instead of their dreams. How many parents are trying to live out their life and their dreams through their children? How many parents want their child to be the smartest and the fastest and the star of the ball team simply because they weren't those things when they were a child? How many children really don't have time to be a child because mom or dad has them involved in so many activities, taking so many lessons, going to so many camps, practicing so long and studying so hard that there's no time left in their schedule to just be a kid? If you want to discourage your child, forget who they are and live out your dreams through them. You discourage your child when you don't prioritize them. We must prioritize our children because they are our first responsibility. If you brought them into this world, then they are your responsibility. Even if it means turning down a job or losing a coveted position. Even if it means falling out of favor with your boss because you say, Boss, I can't be there to make you happy. I've got to be home with my children. Your children must come first. They have to monopolize your time and monopolize your energy. You don't want the stuff, they don't want the stuff that you can buy them nearly as much as they want the time that you can give them. Too many parents make time promises to their children. It's a real easy one for parents to do. Make a time promise that you don't keep. Well, not now, but I'll do it later. I'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it this weekend. You remember the song, The Cats in the Cradle? Now, you've got to be so old to remember this. You remember this? I, I put down the words here because you've you got to hear the words. Because they're sad. They're sad. It's a sad, sad song. It says, My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. But there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking before I knew it. And he grew. And as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, the little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you coming home, Dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? And I said, not today. I got a lot to do, he said. That's okay. And then he walked away, but his smile never dimmed and said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know I'm going to be like him. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you coming home, Dad? I don't know when. But we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. Well, he came home from college just the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, Son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile, What I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you coming home, son, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. You know we'll have a good time then. I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids have the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been nice, sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. And that's a sad song. You discourage your child when you give a bad example. There was a boy that got caught down at the local convenience store stealing erasers. They called his father, and his father came in and went up to the store manager and tried to be apologetic. He said, I don't know why my son would do that. He certainly doesn't need those things. I bring home stuff like that from work every day. What kinds of things are you doing, Mom and Dad? How does the community perceive you, and how does that reflect on your children? What are you teaching them by the example that you set? The thing is, we need to bless our children.
Parents, we're not here to discourage, but we're here to encourage our children. If you want to encourage your child, then don't forget to bless them. To be blessed means that as a father and a mother, you recognize the significance of your child so that they know it. So they know it. We're quick to curse our children. We're quick to tell them that they've done wrong. But how often do we bless them? Now, I'm not talking about praise here. I'm not talking about praise. Praise is telling them that you liked it when they hit the home run. Or you was gratified when they got the A on their math test. But that's not encouragement. Praise has to do with what they accomplish. But encouragement has to do with who they are. Your child isn't a home run or a test score. But they are a somebody. They are your child. Even when they have done nothing that merits your praise, they should know that they are somebody and they are important to you because you encourage them. Okay. Number two. We must nurture our children. He says, bring them up. The same Greek word used in, is used in chapter 5, verse 29, when speaking of Christ nourishing the church. Bring them up. Luke 5.52 says we are to nurture our children in four areas. Intellectually, spiritually, physically, and socially. We're to manage their development by taking responsibility for each of those four things in their life. The food they eat, the friends that they play with, what they're learning in church, and what they're being taught in school. As a godly parent, you cannot ignore these issues. Now, I don't believe in homework. I don't believe in homework. I never have and I never will. When, when a child has been in school all day, they don't need to be in school all night. If we want our children to enjoy being educated, then we can't make education so burdensome that they despise it. When a child goes to school all day and then can't go out and play when they get home because they have a load of homework, we discourage their desire to learn. It isn't fun for them anymore. I remember, remember sitting for hours at night helping our kids with homework. There were nights when there was no TV, there was no playing outside, there was just a quick bite of supper and then homework until bedtime. And I remember how discouraged the, the kids were, just their whole attitude about the, the entire thing, whether it was easy homework or whether it was hard homework. I went to school to address the issue because that's what I did. The teacher's answer was this. Well, I want parents to help their child with their homework. So I ask her, what happens to the child who doesn't have a parent at home to help? She thought for a while and she said, they fail. Not a very good approach if you ask me. But that's my opinion. Proverbs 22 says, train up the child in the way he'll go. When he's old, when he's mature, he'll not depart from it. The Hebrew word used there is derek, meaning to follow their natural bent. Every person that is ever born into this world has a natural bent. It is who they are. It's who God made them to be deep down on the inside. It may not be who you think they ought to be. It may not be who you necessarily wanted them to be. But it's the bent that God put in them. And your responsibility as a parent is to recognize what direction that bend goes. I've always been competitive by nature. That's just been me. I love to compete. You know, I do better when something is a competition. You know, we used to go out golfing and, and, and with uh, uh, preachers. We'd all go out together, and there was four of us. And, and, and two preachers always beat us other two preachers about all the time. But one day we decided that the losers will just buy lunch for the winners. We won. My partner kept saying to me every time I got ready to hit, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. <laughs> and I found that to be motivational. I'm competitive by nature, but Jimmy, my oldest son, is not. Just not in his... Now, you, he may appear to be aggressive in other areas, but not when it comes to those kind of things. I played basketball, and I played baseball, and I played football, and I always wanted the ball in my hands. I wanted to be in that position where I had the ball. Jimmy was offered a position of quarterback on his high school football team, and he turned down the job. He come home from practice one day and it's all disgusted, threw his stuff down. And I said, what are you upset about? He said, they want me to be a quarterback. Coach wants me to be a quarterback. I'm lit up, man. You know, he wants you to be a quarterback. This guy's coached for 30 years. He sees something he wants you to be a quarterback. I don't want to be a quarterback. I said, you crazy? When I played football, they wouldn't even let me talk to the quarterback. <laughs> the high school basketball coach came to him three times and asked him to be on the team. He'd seen him play. 
Jimmy turned him down. I said, are you crazy? Will you turn him down? Why would you want to turn him down? He said, he said to me, he said, Dad, I'd rather run cross country. <laughs> my, head all, my head almost exploded. Now, I didn't get mad. It's just that I couldn't wrap my mind around the idea of cross country. Now, Marty, maybe you, you guys can appreciate this or not. You and Nancy, I don't know. Have you ever watched kids run cross country? They all look like they're being punished. <laughs> Nobody's happy. Nobody's smiling. They're all like, man, they're like, oh, they're making me do that. Every kid that's out there. You know, if Hitler would have known about cross country, I think he would have made the Jews do it. <laughs> Jimmy told me, he said, Dad, I like cross country because there I'm competing against myself. What I'm telling you is this. I had to come to the realization that Jimmy wasn't me. God made him different than he made me. His bent was in another direction. And it wasn't my job to bend him back the other way. But it was my job to encourage the bent that God put in him. The Hebrew example here means to make it palatable. Some animals will chew the food and put it on the palate of their young to excite their taste buds and, and make, them, make them want to swallow, make them want to eat. Many people treat their dogs better than they do their kids. They'll buy their animals special food and they'll buy it outfits to wear and toys to play with and furniture to lay in. But at the same time, they spend very little effort encouraging the gifts that God has put in their child. We'll use positive and reinforcement on our pet, but we don't even consider it using it on our children. He says, make it palatable. Make a design. If you see in them what it is that they want to do with their life, what they want to be. You know, if you've got a son that's like six foot eight and you think he ought to be the star of the basketball team and he comes to you and he says, Dad, I want to play the trombone. Your job is to buy him a trombone. Make it palatable. Okay, number three, real quick. Third thing we need to do is we must discipline our children. Hebrews 12, 6 says, Whom the Lord loves, he skins alive. That's paraphrased. <laughs> Love is always demonstrated by discipline. Now, some of you guys is around my age, you remember your parents saying something like this, I'm doing this because I love you. Bend over. <laughs> and some of us got loved a lot, you know. We're all born under a curse. Now, some of you think that your children are little angels birthed with a spark of divinity in them. But the truth of the matter is, the Bible says that they are born with hell in them. And your job as a parent, my job as a parent, is to challenge Satan's ownership of our children. They're born in sin. They're born separated from God and under a curse before they ever draw their first breath. That's why you don't have to teach them to lie and to cheat or to have a bad attitude. You look at your child acting up and you're thinking, where did they get that? They were born with that. They were born with that. That's why you don't have to go to the bookstore and find a book on how to teach my child to have a tantrum. They are born with hell in them and your job, mom and dad, is to knock hell out of them. Okay? But children are never to be disciplined apart from love. When you discipline a child without love, you either do physical damage or you do emotional damage. If they don't know that you love them when you discipline them, you can hurt them physically, which is child abuse, or you can hurt them emotionally, which is psychological damage. That's why correcting your children when you're angry is not the right time. Some parents have to count to ten before they proceed. Proverbs 13.24 says, He who spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Now, you have to understand, a rod was not a club. It was a spanking utensil that would sting but would do no damage. It would hurt, but it wouldn't abuse. We used to have a wooden spoon at our house. It weighed nothing. It was made out of balsa wood or something. I don't know. I mean, you could get a run and start with this thing, swing as hard as you possibly could, and the only damage you were really going to do was to the spoon itself. But it would sting when it was used properly. Now all of our kids reacted differently to the spoon. Angie, <laughs> didn't matter. You give her the spoon, and Angie would turn around and look at you, and so say, that didn't hurt. You give it to her again, go, that all you got? You know, nothing. Now, Jimmy, on the other hand, Mr. Non-Competitive, 
You'd hold him by this arm and you'd chase him in a circle like this. <laughs> All the time he's going, oh! and I said, I haven't whipped you yet. You thought we was beating him half to death. Many parents have abandoned the rod. They've traded the rod for a time out. They've traded the rod for a discussion. They traded in the rod for a lot of things because our sophisticated society has declared spanking as child abuse. I'd like to ask, how's that working out for society? What kind of positive results can we show for that approach that we've used in the last 20, 30 years? Children who are in the learning mode, who are learning how to act and how to treat other people, must come to understand that there is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. They have to come to understand that acceptable behavior has its rewards, while unacceptable behavior has its consequences. If you teach your child that unacceptable behavior does not have painful consequences, they'll come to believe that that's how life works. They'll grow up expecting their teachers to treat them that way and police officers to treat them that way and the law to treat them that way and the government to treat them that way. A spanking today is much better than an electric chair tomorrow. Now that only works for so long. Your child's going to get to an age where that, you know, you can't have it like an 18-year-old kid go, okay, now bend over. That ain't going to work. There are a lot more painful things you could do to an 18-year-old or a 16-year-old. You hand me the car keys. That hurts really, really bad. That hurts really, really bad. But our ch children have to understand that there are consequences to undesired behavior. And because we haven't taught them that, because we've abandoned what the Word says, and we've gone with what society says, we have children that cannot be ruled by anybody. So what do we do? Oh, let's give them a pill. Let's dope them up so they're set still. You know... We don't dis teach, di we don't discipline kids at church. You're, that's not our responsibility. That job is mom and dad's job at home. But I'll tell you, a lot of times we have our hands full here because of what's not being taught in the home. Proverbs 19.18 says, Discipline your son while there is hope and do not desire his death. Proverbs 22.15, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Proverbs 23, 13, do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you beat him with the rod, he will not die. He may think he's dying. He, neighbors might think he's dying. You will beat him with the rod and deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod of, and reproof gives wisdom, but a child that gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 29, 17, correct your son and he will give you comfort. He will also delight in your soul. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 is a story of Eli and his two sons. Eli was a passive parent. There was a child acting up in a restaurant one night, and, and, and he just was out of hand, making noise, banging dishes, throwing stuff on the floor. And every time he would do something wrong, his mother would lean over to him and say, Now, if you do that again, I'm going to give you a spanking. And then he'd do it again. And she'd go, If you do that again, I'm going to give you a spanking. And then she, he'd do it again. And then she'd lean over to him. And finally, the man sitting at the table next to him turned around, leaned over to the mother, and said, If you don't give him a spanking pretty soon, you're going to disappoint the both of us. <laughs> Eli overdelegated his responsibility as a parent, he was passive. Instead of doing his job as the head of the household, he copped out. As a result of his passive parenting, his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, misused the church. They slept with female ushers in the temple, and they stole from God. And in chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says that God judged Eli's house. Eli told his sons that they were doing wrong. He, he was quick to tell them, now that's wrong, boys. Now, boys, you had not to be doing that. But he did nothing about the wrong that they were doing. He didn't stand up as the man of the house and stop his sons from doing what they were doing. In chapter 4 and verse 17 it says the boys were killed. The ark of God was stolen and the Bible says that Eli fell backwards and he died. Phineas's wife died hearing the news while giving birth and she named her son Ichabod meaning the glory of the Lord has departed. This is what's happening in our society today. The glory of the Lord is on its way out because children are not being made obey their parents but the parents are obeying the children kids are suing parents kids are having their mom and dad locked up the insane are in charge of the asylum 
We've lost our freedom because we've failed to maintain the stability of the office of parent. There's only room for one set of parents in your home, and you're it. You're it. Tony Evans. I love to hear Tony Evans teach. Matter of fact, some of this information I, I, I got from him. Tony Evans told a story of his brother. His brother was a heavyweight wrestler, a huge, muscular, strong young man. One day, his father had asked his brother to do something. His brother refused what his dad asked him to do. And to make matters worse, he just got mouthy to his dad because he's a big, strong wrestler. And he said, well, if you don't like it, Dad, I'll just move out. And with that, his dad packed his suitcase. It was the dead of winter. It was snowing outside. It was frigid temperatures outside. But with that rash statement, his brother had forgotten a few things. He forgot that it was the dead of winter. He forgot that he didn't have a job and that he didn't have any money. And he didn't have a coat because his dad had bought the coat too. And so he left. Tony Evans said three hours went by and later this giant of a man brother of his came back to the house and he said, Dad, what was that thing you wanted me to do again? We've kind of lost that over the years. My grandpa Fry, my dad's dad, they called him Pop. Pop was five foot seven, never weighed over 135 pounds in his entire life. My grandpa maintained the same shape, the same condition, lived way up into his 90s that he, all of his life. I remember Grandpa would sit down at the table, he straight up, back straight up in the air, he would eat what was on his plate, and then he was finished, and he was done. He never took seconds, he never had extra. He just ate that, and that was it. He would sleep on a couch propped up like this every night. It was kind of creepy as a kid to go and see Grandpa sleeping. You know, he, he was like that, but that's how he slept every night. Very disciplined. But I want you to know something. There were ten kids in my dad's family, many of which were boys. All of these grown men uh, had great jobs, drove Cadillacs and Lincolns, had families, had children and grandchildren. They were all successful in what they did. But when they came home, Pop, no matter how old he was, ruled the roost. I remember my grandpa at 90 telling those grown men what they were going to do, and they did it. It has to do with respect for the office of parent. And we've lost that. We've lost that. Parents, you have to keep in mind when you're disciplining, disciplining your child, you're not breaking their will. You're breaking the curse. That's what you're doing battle with. You're not doing battle with your child. You're doing battle with the enemy who has his hands on your child. Fourthly, we have to instruct our children. Dad, supported by moms, give your children a biblical education. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then when you eat and you're satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery." Fear the Lord your God. Serve Him only and take your oaths in His name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and His anger will burn against you, and He will destroy you from the face of the land. God instructed the Israelites to teach your children that there is but one God, one love, 
and one law. That's all. We get upset because they've taken the Ten Commandments out of the courtroom. And they've taken the Ten Commandments out of the school. But I want to know, are they hanging in your home? God never commissioned the government to teach your children about him. He never commanded the school to educate your kids on spirituality. That's your job. Are you doing it? God said, you do it. Teach them consistently, diligently, verbally, by example, creatively, and conspicuously. But what if it's too late? Parents are responsible for the children led by the father. But what if it's too late? What if my kids are too old, then what do I do? What, what if I did it wrong and now my children are adults and they're living away from God? Psalm 127 and verse 4 compares children to arrows. He said, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. You ever shot an arrow? Anybody ever shoot an arrow? It's not, it's not, it's uh, a, lot of, a lot of things involved there, isn't there, when you shoot an arrow. It's not like shooting a gun where just point A, point a to point B and nothing hardly ever affects it. An arrow, a lot of things can affect an arrow. When you were rearing your children, you shot crooked. The target was over here, but you shot over there. You aimed, and you thought that you were aiming right, or maybe you really didn't care where your aim was, but your aim was way off. There were elements that you didn't take into, into account, and you missed the bullseye with your children, and you missed it badly. So what do you do now? You've already raised your children, but you did it wrong. What do you do about that now? God says, you get on your knees, and you pray to God for a good wind. You pray for the Holy Spirit to blow in and correct your mistakes so your arrow will strike the target and your children will still have hope. It's only too late if you quit. It's only too late if you quit. Your children will be your children till the day you die. They're always your children. I remind my kids every now and then, doesn't matter how old they are, I'm still their dad. My dad used to tell me that. Doesn't matter how old you get, I'm still your dad. Told me a lot of other things too. I'm processing those and telling them to my kids now. But it's only too late if you quit. And if you quit, the pretty people that are supposed to be over the children no longer exist. And the enemy has free reign. So never give up. Father, I just thank you tonight, again, for another lesson about the family and, God, the things that your word teaches us. God, maybe some things that we didn't know. Maybe some things we weren't aware of. But, God, certainly things that we do need to know. God, help us to do, to do it your way. We've taken the advice of so many people that are supposed to be experts, and, God, we just see failure one right after another. God, help us to be intelligent enough to just sit down with your word and do what it says. Father, I pray for the parents, the new parents that are just starting out. Give them the wisdom they need. I pray for the parents that are now dealing with older children, that are dealing with issues and struggles. Give them the wisdom they need. And God, I pray for parents whose kids are grown, but maybe they didn't do it quite right, that they will stay on their knees until the wind of the Holy Spirit moves in and corrects that shot of theirs that was way off target. Father, we are their hope because we are responsible for their souls. Father, bless our efforts. Give us the strength and courage to do it and to do it right. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.